Hi everyone, good evening. Nice to see you. Some new faces. Good to see you. And just like your new faces are here, we also have a new face on the stage today. So Prithvi is debuting from our research team. Uh, Prithvi tracks uh, lending businesses, uh, NBFCs, banks, and so on. And I think this topic is quite interesting for everyone. So Prithvi, over to you. Thanks, Ranak. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today we'll be looking at new banks and try to answer this question: if it will be the future of banking. Uh, so previously on FOF, Rajiv had already covered this topic uh, in around uh, May of 2016, uh, when the neo banking fad was still it, uh, still was uh, when it was still it, in its infancy. Uh, so I will be trying to build on that presentation. Uh, if anyone haven't seen this, then it would be a good starting point. Uh, so today's agenda will be first we'll be covering about uh, uh, looking at traditional banks, uh, a brief history of the banking industry. Uh, then we look at the business model of traditional banks, and then we'll go into the neo banks, uh, understand what neo banks are, and then we'll take an example of a neo bank and try to do a deeper dive into it. Uh, after that, we'll be uh, comparing the traditional banking model with the neo banking model, and finally, we'll try to answer this question. Uh, yeah, so banking is a very old uh, business activity; it is as old as the civilization. Uh, so, at its core, banking is nothing but it's an intermediary which connects the, the, uh, people who have excess money, excess funds, to those who are in requirement of funds. Uh, and by doing that, it uh, earns an interest rate differential. So, the bank pays the depositor a lower interest rate and it earns a higher interest rate from the borrowers. Uh, the difference between those two is what the bank earns. Uh, yeah. And uh, this activity helps uh, the depositor in diversifying his risk. Otherwise, he will have to go and find a borrower for his uh, excess funds. Uh, so the bank provides the service of diversifying the risk. Uh, after that, it has evolved into offering other related uh, services for additional income. Uh, so over time, uh, bank. Uh, so initially, banking was largely unregulated. Uh, everybody could do whatever they wanted. But over uh, over time, the industry has become a very regulated industry. So we'll first look at how uh, the industry has uh, gone under various regulatory changes. Uh, so we'll to, uh, we'll take two countries as examples. Uh, first, USA, then followed by India. Uh, so prior to 1863, it was largely a free banking era uh, uh, in USA. Uh, so what I mean by that is, uh, so initially when USA was formed in 1770s. Uh, in initially, there was a big dispute whether banks should be a state subject. Uh, so initially, uh, yeah, when US got its independence, there was a big dispute whether banks should be a state subject or a uh, federal subject. Uh, sent, uh, uh, followed by which uh, there were a couple of banking acts which were tried to which uh, which the government tried to pass, but uh, they didn't work out. And eventually, it turned out in, uh, it became a state subject. And uh, all the states uh, were not very keen on regulating it. Uh, and uh, everybody who wanted a banking charter license uh, could easily get it. Uh, this continued uh, till 1863. Uh, by 1863, uh, uh, by the end of civil war, what happened was uh, 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 people were issuing banknotes as they wanted. Uh, ideally, they should be it should be backed by some gold or silver. Uh, uh, but a lot of people were not following it and uh, issuing the banknotes as they wanted, uh, and this led to a crisis and. Uh, this led to a National Banking Act in 1863. So uh, in the National Banking Act, uh, Office for Controller of Currency was uh, created. And uh, it was a national agency which was responsible for, uh, uh, re responsible for regulating the banks. Uh, yeah, uh, again, uh, so the main part of the act was uh, basically for whatever banknotes that bank issued, uh, it has to be backed by uh, some uh, US government security. Uh, this uh, worked out well till about 1907, but by 1907 the economy had uh, 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 turned into a more complex one than what was there in 1863, and the National Banking Act was acting as a limiter. A uh, lot of the funds were concentrated into few hands, and there were liquidity crisis uh, liquidity crisis in 19, uh, 1907. Uh, at that time, there was no federal bank to act as a backstop and to provide the liquidity. Uh, this resulted in a uh, lot of uh, bank runs in uh, New York and surrounding areas. Uh, so this, from 1907 to 1913, there were a lot of deliberations. And then finally, a federal banking act was passed. 
uh, this created the US federal bank system uh, that we know of as, to, as of today. Uh, again, this system also worked till from 1913 to 1933. Uh, but in 1929, the Great uh, Depression happened. And the, uh, this Federal Banking Act was not uh, uh, stringent enough to uh, control the banks. Uh, so in 1933, there was something called the Glass-Steagall Act, which was enacted. Uh, so uh, till 1933 in USA, uh, uh, a bank could do investment banking activities with the money it got from its commercial banking. So it could take deposits from people and uh, then use that deposits to do speculative investment banking activities. So that was one of the main reasons for the 1929 crisis. Uh, so to correct that, uh, a new banking act uh, uh, was uh, enacted. Uh, it is known as the New Deal. Uh, which was more stringent, and also the Glass-Steagall Act was there, uh, which made it, uh, in, uh, which basically separated the commercial banks and the investment banks, uh, and they couldn't use the funds interchangeably. Uh, so this again worked from 1980 to, uh, uh, sorry, 1933 to 1980. Uh, but by 1980, uh, while the banking system was healthy, uh, there was a lack of innovation, uh, lack of innovation, and also. In the new deal that was enacted in 1933, it was very difficult for a bank to operate across multiple states. Uh, they had to take individual charters from each state and all. So 1980 onwards, there were a lot of deregulations uh, where some of these uh, protections enacted in 1933 were slowly removed, and it became uh, much easier for the banks to uh, move across state boundaries. Uh, yeah, so because of these deregulations in 1980s, in that one decade, uh, almost 4,000 banks got merged. And in 1990s, about 6,000 banks got merged. Uh, so this is a brief chart. So the end products are Citigroup, uh, JM Financial Chase, uh, sorry, JP Morgan uh, Chase, uh, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. But during this era from 1990 to 2009, uh, it went through all these mergers and acquisitions. Uh, yeah, so overall, there was a lot of consolidation in the banking industry. And these four emerged as the top, uh, top commercial banks. Uh, yeah, uh, and another development which was happening internationally was the Basel norms. So by 1990s, banking uh, basically globalization has started taking place, and uh, banking has become more of a globalized thing. Uh, if there was some issue in one country, it was no longer uh, restricted to that country, and it could affect the uh, entire financial uh, financial health of other countries too. So keeping this in mind, some of the central banks got together and formed a Basel committee, and they came out with certain Basel norms, uh, which are uh, to ensure that uh, proper capital adequacy is being followed, uh, the credit risk, operational risk, and market risk are being priced in correctly, and all. So there have been three Basel norms so far. We are currently in the Basel norms three, uh, Basel three norms. Uh, yeah, this all worked out uh, well till 2008, but again, 2008, uh, banks started uh, speculating uh, with the money because the deregulation de from 1980 allowed them to. Uh, and again, we know what happened in the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, and because of that, again, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act uh, was uh, uh, enacted, which uh, restricted banks from doing, uh, from participating in speculative instruments. Uh, yeah, so if you look at the current the banking industry in USA, it still continues to be a uh, very well spread out uh, uh, industry. Currently, as, as of uh, CY 2021, there are about 4,236 FIDC-insured commercial banks in USA. Uh, so only about three are very large. Uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Bank of America have more than 11% market share, followed by Wells Fargo at 8.25, and Citibank at about four banks. And the market share starts to drop uh, significantly. So top 15 banks, these are the top 15 banks. They account for about 54% uh, of the market share. So, and the remaining banks uh, account for the remaining 46%. Uh, so, this is about the US uh, banking uh, regulations, how they have evolved. Uh, so, again, these three books are, uh, uh, sorry, first one is a book which is highly recommended to understand the history of banking, how it has changed from 1860s to 1990. And the second person is uh, Robert Wilmers. He is the MD and C he was the MD and CEO of a bank called MNT Bank. It's a, a small regional focused bank, uh, but uh, uh, he has done a very well, a very good job from 1983 to 2017, and he's one of uh, Buffett's and Munger's favorite bankers. 
uh, and uh, like Buffett and Munger, he also writes a shareholder letter every year. And if you want to get a good understanding of how the banking industry evolved during this, his time, uh, then his letters uh, would be a good read. And then there's this book called Bank Town. Uh, this is about uh, banks based out of Charlotte, North, Cal uh, North Carolina. Uh, so basically, there are two banks uh, uh, which are based out of uh, North Carolina. Uh, so one is Bank of America, and another is Wachovia Bank, which, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which went on to merge with Wells Fargo. So this book covers those two banks uh, and how how this all how all these mergers affected the culture over there, uh, how the city got affected, and all. Uh, it's an interesting read uh, to understand the merger uh, scenario in the from 2000 to 2010, and it briefly touches upon the financial crisis also. Uh, yeah. So coming to banking industry in India. Uh, so from 1700s onwards, when the first uh, uh, bank was set up to about 1969. Banking in India was largely uh, driven by uh, trade and commerce. Uh, initially, the British uh, uh, established some banks to uh, uh, to enable uh, their uh, trade to UK. Uh, yeah, and followed by uh, slowly uh, some of the in around early 1900s, uh, sorry, in 1850s and all, some of the localized more localized banks also started. Uh, taking shape. Uh, so, for example, Allahabad Bank and all uh, uh, took shape during this period. Uh, for in the early 1900s, because of the Swadesh movement, lot of in uh, lot of industrialists wanted to establish their own Indian uh, banks, and uh, we have some some of the banks coming from this era. Uh, yeah. So, in uh, so some of the major banks were uh, uh, Bank of Bengal, Bank of uh, uh, Bombay and uh, Bank of Madras, which were eventually merged into Imperial Bank, and this later on turned into State Bank of India in 1995. Uh, yeah, uh, apart from State Bank of India, uh, State Bank of India, uh, most of the other banks were privately owned. Uh, in 1969, uh, government felt that these private banks were not doing enough to ensure that all the banking services were reaching the uh, reaching all the needy people, especially the farmers, small scale industries, and all. Uh, and they decided that they will nationalize some of the banks. In 19, 19, 1969, about 14 banks were nationalized. Uh, followed, uh, following uh, after this, in 1980, another six banks were nationalized. Uh, so this continued on till 1991. And 1991, again, as you know, Indian economy opened up. And in by 1994, uh, the government decided that we need some. Uh, we can we can start allowing some private sector banks uh, to build, uh, to get more efficiency into the system. So in 1994, about 10 banks were given license, uh, of which uh, six are still existing. Other four were merged uh, in the in between periods. Uh, and uh, yeah, so brand new banks started from 1994. Uh, these 10 banks started from 1994 onwards. And in 2003, we had a uh, another round of bank licenses, where for the first time, an NBFC got converted into a bank, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank. And also, a new license was given to Yes Bank. Uh, and again, in 2014, uh, there were two other banks which were allowed. One was IDFC Bank, and the other was a Bandhan Bank. Uh, yeah, and largely 2010 to 2020 on the on the corporate side was largely driven by the NPMS that had happened in the last four to five years. Uh, and uh, most of the banks spent this uh, time in cleaning up, cleaning up the cleaning up their books and uh, making provisions for the NPS. Another theme that was playing out in the in this last uh, decade was financial inclusion. Uh, uh, so, bank, so government wanted uh, banking banking services to be available to each and every person of the country, and launched the Jandan Yojana program. Uh, uh, yeah, apart, uh, so, a uh, lot of uh, new bank accounts were opened, and uh, even so some of the services like uh, direct benefit transfer and all started taking place. So, if we look at the Current situation in India. So compared to India, uh, compared to US, India has very uh, low number of banks. There are 137 scheduled commercial banks, of which uh, 43 are the regional rural banks. So these are the Grameen banks uh, mostly. Uh, then we have four payment banks, uh, 12 small finance banks, uh, followed by 45 foreign banks. Uh, in foreign banks, most of them have just uh, one or two branch presence in India. Uh, apart from uh, DBS India, uh, DBS Bank India Limited, 
uh, which is a which has its wholly own subsidiary in India and uh, it can operate pretty much as an Indian bank. And another is State Bank of Mauritius, uh, which, which also recently got a uh, which also recently set up a wholly owned subsidiary in India. And then, yeah, sorry, one more thing I forgot to mention was in 2018 onwards, uh, there was a lot of consolidation in the public sector banks space. So all the SBI banks and its associates were merged into uh, into one into SBI, and among the remaining uh, public sector banks also there were a lot of consolidation. Uh, so currently we have about 12 public sector banks and 21 private sector banks. Uh, so these 33 banks, the public sector banks and private sector banks, uh, uh, almost uh, have majority of the market share. Uh, either you see by deposits or by loan market share. Uh, these uh, these banks, these 30. Three banks have about nine, more than 90% of the market share. Uh, so again, if we compare it to the US industry, we are quite concentrated in uh, in terms of uh, banking uh, market share over here. Uh, yeah, among these 33, I think only one Nainital bank is not listed. Apart from that, all the remaining 32 are listed. Uh, so yeah, again, to get a better understanding of the history of banking in India, uh, these are some of the books that provide a very detailed explanation. Uh, again, all are very famous books, so you can look at them. Uh, so traditional banking model has been largely branch driven so far. Uh, it, uh, it depended on the physical, physical touch points to uh, provide services. Uh, while this uh, had a cost of expensive, uh, uh, it, while well, it was expensive to set up the branches and uh, uh, maintain the branches, the employees in each of these branches, it helped them in maintain, in developing relationships. Uh, and with the help of these relationships, the uh, banks could uh, cross sell uh, additional products. Uh, and this not only created additional uh, uh, loan products and uh, re its uh, interest income, but also some uh, some third party products they could sell and uh, generate fee income. And uh, in traditional banking, it was largely full service banks only uh, because it was not uh, cost efficient to be a single line banker or to serve only a niche category of uh, customers uh, because of the expensive setup costs and all. Uh, this somewhat eased when internet banking started taking off in early 2000s. Uh, and when the internet uh, access became uh, better from 2010 onwards, it further eased, but still it required a lot of branch visits and all. Uh, even account opening and all required branch visits and uh, not all services were available online. Yeah, so we'll briefly look at what a traditional bank business looks like. Uh, so in banking industry, it's kind of opposite of what we see in normal industrial company, manufacturing companies and all. So assets for a bank are the loans that it gives. Uh, so here we are looking at three banks. Uh, I haven't named the banks, but the first bank is from India, the second one is from USA, the third one is from Singapore. Uh, so in India, the loans form a major part of the overall lending, uh, lending space, uh, uh, sorry, overall asset base. Uh, about 60% of these banks' uh, assets are in form of loans. After that, banks have to maintain certain uh, investments in government securities. This is to meet some statutory uh, requirements because they hold public deposits. Uh, in, in case uh, there's a redemption of deposits, then the bank can sell these uh, government securities easily and uh, repay the deposits. Yeah, so about 19% is government securities. Uh, and then cash and bank balance is about 8%. And then some banks do credit substitute products. So instead of doing traditional loan products, uh, they might be offering some products which are in the form of, say, debenture and all, uh, based on the requirement of the customer and all. So that is another 8%. And 4% is some other uh, other assets. Uh, USA, if you see, uh, the loans are lower at about 46% of the book. Uh, but government securities are 15%. But in that 15%, there is something called uh, mortgage-based securities, which are owned by uh, two government entities called FEDIME and FEDIMAC. Uh, so basically, what they can do is, instead of holding uh, just pure government securities, US banks can hold these government securities in order to meet the statutory requirements. So because of that, uh, there, there are some amount of mortgage loans also in this 15%. Uh, 
uh, yeah, and then cash and bank balances for uh, this particular bank is uh, a bit high because of some restrictions placed on it uh, at about 13%. Uh, and then credit substitutes is also somewhat higher at about 12%. Uh, yeah, uh, others are about 14%. Uh, again, Singapore is more or less a mix between uh, India and the USA. Uh, you can see it over here. Uh, so if we just take the loans part of this, uh, this entire thing, uh, and break it up further. Uh, so in India, uh, in all the three countries, wherever you see mortgage loans or home loans are the uh, are one of the significant part of the bank, uh, bank's uh, loan book. So for this bank, about 34% of the loan books are mortgage loans. Uh, followed by uh, uh, vehicle loans at 8 percent, agree loans at 9 percent, personal loans 7 percent and credit card is about 3 percent. So overall this uh, entire uh, retail loan book, the, all these three are retail segments, uh, retail loans and these uh, all together constitute about uh, 60 percent. Uh, and for this bank, uh, uh, yeah, so for this bank uh, about 20, 25, 26, 27 percent is uh, corporate loans and uh, remaining about 11 bank 11 percent is SME loans. Uh, USA is also uh, somewhat similar in the sense that mortgage loans are a huge portion. Uh, actually US mortgage market is much bigger but uh, because of the securitization aspect to it a uh, lot of loans don't stay in the bank's books uh, and mostly are securitized. Uh, so because of that it looks at uh, slightly lower at about 13, 31 percent. So for this bank about 47 percent of the book is retail loans and uh, remaining 52 53 percent is uh, corporate loans. Uh, Singapore, uh, again, so Singapore is a global trading hub and because of that, uh, the Singapore banks have a lot of uh, trade financing uh, that they do. Uh, so because of that, their corporate loans are a huge amount and also Singapore, the housing market is also not uh, that big. Uh, so because of that, the housing loans are smaller, per, uh, smaller uh, percentage. Uh, so coming to the liability side, so here for bank, uh, deposits will be the main liabilities uh, followed by whatever borrowings that they would be doing. So to fund these assets, the bank will need, uh, will need uh, liabilities and deposits are the cheapest source of liabilities that a bank can have. Uh, so India, for the Indian bank about 75% is deposits, 12% uh, is equity, 8% is other borrowings, 5% uh, uh, is other liabilities. So this is somewhat same across all the countries. Uh, all the banks look to have a very good uh, deposit base uh, because it is the cheapest source of funding that is available to them. Uh, yeah, again, if you see the just the deposits breakup, uh, so current account deposits are somewhat lower in India uh, because we don't follow that strict uh, uh, rules of uh, current account being, uh, sorry, savings account being used for only a small number of transactions and uh, all the transactions should happen through current account. So in India, we do all the transactions from savings account. Yeah, so CASA, these two together are uh, somewhat low cost of funding sources. Uh, and this is an important uh, metric to look at. Uh, yeah, about 46, 47% of the loans for this bank are uh, the current account and saving account deposits. Uh, remaining will be the term deposits. In USA, the implementation of this current uh, current account and uh, differentiation between current account and savings account is quite strict. So you'll see a lot of deposits staying in the current account uh, instead of uh, being transferred into the savings account. Uh, same uh, in Singapore again, it's a mix of both uh, current account is and savings account together constitute about 75 percent, uh, and term deposits are about 24 percent. Uh, so this chart will explain on, uh, will give us an indication on how to look at the uh, in, uh, ROE generation ability of a bank. So as I said uh, earlier, so banks will be giving out interest, uh, giving out loans and be, they'll be earning interest income on that. Uh, and they'll be paying interest expense to the uh, depositors. Uh, so these two together, uh, we get what is called as a net interest margin. Uh, so this will be the difference of these two. So basically the red ones are the expenses kind of things, uh, green ones are the income. Uh, so this is the net interest margin that the banks earn. Uh, apart from that, uh, banks have also diversified into offering other fee and uh, uh, commission based services and they earn some income from there. Uh, then another, uh, the major expense that the banks have is the operating expenses. Uh, this involves paying uh, staff. Uh, 
uh, setting up banks, running the banks, maintaining the banks and all. Uh, and after that, there's something called provisions. So the loans that the bank gives, uh, as long as they are good, uh, it is fine. But once they start turning bad, uh, in the sense the repayment is not happening properly, they'll have to start providing for those loans. Uh, so basically, they'll have to take a hit in the p and L for those loans. Uh, so again, so higher provisions will be a detrimental thing. Uh, it will say that the underwriting of the bank is not very good. And finally, we have the tax expenses. So if you, from the net interest income that you get here, if you add the other income, uh, remove the OPEX provisions and tax, then you'll get the uh, return on assets. And uh, again, uh, banks are leveraged businesses. Uh, if you multiply it with the leverage, you'll get the, about the uh, ROI that the bank is generating. So same in US and Singapore. So while the US and Singapore interest rates are low and the uh, NIM might look low, uh, but it is compensated uh, from the other activity, uh, other uh, compensated in the other columns. Uh, so eventually, so US and Singapore, USA banks are in slightly in the high teen, uh, high single digit and the low uh, 10, 11, 12% kind of uh, ROEs. Uh, Indian, good run Indian banks can expect about 15% ROEs. And uh, Singapore banks are in between. Uh, again, uh, this year actually the USF numbers look quite good because they did a lot of provisions earlier and they had to write back those provisions and uh, because of that the numbers look uh, a bit decent. Uh, so with this context, now we'll start looking at the neo banks. Uh, so, and so to understand what are neo banks, uh, so basically these are branchless digital banks which have no physical presence, uh, no physical presence. So they won't be have operating any branches, and every all the services will be provided online, uh, right from uh, uh, opening an account to. Uh, whatever uh, financial requirements you have, starting an FD or taking a loan and all, all everything will be online. Uh, so these are generally run by uh, tech savvy entrepreneurs or tech savvy companies. A uh, lot of neo banks are have some amount of backing by tech companies, uh, and it is kind of like a platform approach to banking. So they'll, so on their platform you could do, do not just banking, but uh, say uh, you could uh, browse for other financial products or uh, even some platforms allow uh, some neo banks are look, uh, allow uh, shopping and all also. Uh, this segment has mostly focused on uh, uh, retail and SME clients so far. Uh, and uh, the one of the feature that is expected in this uh, neo banking industry is it is expected to have lower operating uh, costs. Uh, this is because they won't be uh, they won't be required to set up any of the branches. Uh, and for, uh, because uh, any of the branches and uh, don't have to maintain such a big uh, uh, staff base. Uh, so because of that, it is expected to have lower uh, uh, operating costs. And uh, also a lot of these uh, uh, neo banks claim that their credit costs, credit costs will be lower because they look at a holistic approach of the client. Uh, they do data analysis of the client. Uh, they uh, take uh, data from other platform sources that the, uh, that the client is using or if they have their own other uh, services, uh, they look at the history of the client in, uh, when they are using those other services like say shopping and all. And because of that, the banks claim, the neo banks are claiming that their credit cost should be lower. Uh, apart from that, uh, they intend to earn additional source of revenue through the platform approach. So they'll be getting some fee and commission income and all uh, 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 when they send clients to buy some stuff uh, uh, on the e-commerce sites and all. Uh, so. Sorry, this is not as visible. Uh, so if you see from 2014 onwards, especially in the Asian market, uh, the neo banking industry has exploded a lot. Uh, so I'll just highlight some of the major countries. Uh, so in China, it started in 2014 uh, with the launch of WeBank, which was part of Tencent Group. Uh, and um, my bank, which was, uh, which was a, uh, sorry, WeBank was a retail focused bank and my bank was a uh, SME focused bank. Uh, and a uh, lot of uh, regulators saw, uh, saw this as an opportunity to promote uh, financial inclusion. And uh, in a lot of countries, in especially Southeast Asia, uh, the banks were very open to giving out this uh, digital banking only licenses. Uh, we'll see in the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so there were so regulators, those who wanted uh, neo banks, so their arguments were it would promote financial inclusion. 
and it would uh, promote uh, competition and efficiency. Uh, they felt that these uh, tech players will be able to uh, run the banks in a more efficient manner, uh, and this would uh, result in overall improvement in the efficiency of the entire banking system. Uh, and some of the regulators were against the against the new banks concept. Uh, they felt that it would it could uh, uh, become a systematic risk, uh, and also the privacy and uh, security issues were also there. Uh, so eventually, a lot of the lot of regulators came out with a compromise solution. Uh, they sh started issuing digital bank license, but with some restrictions. Uh, so if we see some examples, uh, so Singapore uh, 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 Singapore uh, opened digital only banks, uh, uh, but they restricted on uh, uh, how much investments that they uh, how much sorry deposits that they can take. Uh, same with uh, uh, so. Same with Australia also, they restricted the number of amount of deposits that uh, the banks can take. Uh, yeah, uh, again, a lot of uh, restrictions were either on the deposits that the banks can take or the loan type of loans that the banks could give. So if you take the example of Korea, uh, while they did not restrict the number of uh, deposits that the bank could take, uh, they restricted the type of loans that the uh, banks, uh, the digital banks could do. So they restricted it to only short-term loan products, so maximum three-year kind of loan products, uh, two to three-year uh, kind of loan products. Uh, again, uh, some of the countries like Australia and all imposed uh, the maximum size that the new bank uh, could uh, reach, uh, about uh, 100 million Australian dollars. Uh, and once uh, they felt that the banks were established, they slowly, they slowly started increasing the limits. Uh, Yeah, so we'll understand what has what were some of the key enablers for uh, this boom of new banks in uh, Asia. Uh, so first one was the digital access uh, that with the in the last decade uh, we all saw uh, even in India the uh, boom of uh, uh, access to mobile and internet has uh, tremendously grown up uh, because of this. Lot of people who were earlier in remote locations or could not afford to access mobile and internet were suddenly able to uh, access the mobile and internet. And next one was the demographics and economy. Uh, so again, uh, demographic wise, a uh, lot of young population who are just uh, turning into professionals and started earning age, uh, started earning uh, were uh, there in the Asian market. Uh, and even the economy has also started, uh, economy of these Asian countries also started doing well uh, during this period. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, gave, uh, this ma made the, you, uh, citizens of the countries feel that uh, a proper uh, banking system would be useful and they started looking into formalized uh, banking systems. And then one another common feature a lot of these countries have is the unbanked or the underbanked population. Uh, again, uh, because the traditional banking system was uh, cost uh, heavily uh, cost sensitive, a uh, lot of people were left underbanked or unbanked. Uh, so, but with the advent of uh, this digital access and uh, the young demographics, a lot of these people started looking uh, into uh, these digital banking solutions. Uh, another thing was the infrastructure that was available in these countries. So, if we take the example of India, with the uh, uh, with the launching of Aadhaar, we could uh, uh, we could do eKYC process without having to visit any branch. Uh, we could authenticate everything through uh, Aadhaar based systems. Uh, so, similar eKYC processes in other other countries also uh, helped in uh, growing this. Uh, uh, have acted as enablers for neo banking system. Again, the payment networks also, as we see on uh, see in India through UPI and all, uh, and also a lot of regulatory willingness was also there uh, in a lot of these countries, uh, mainly for financial inclusion uh, purposes. Uh, and also in a lot of these countries, the traditional banks were kind of laid back and uh, lazy. Uh, they were slow to adopt to these digital changes and. Uh, uh, they kind of let these uh, tech platforms, tech players, uh, take a uh, uh, have a, a starting advantage. And uh, yeah, again, with the young population that was there in these countries, uh, the gamification of the banking also happened. Uh, so a lot of these uh, new banks started uh, like uh, uh, goal ta goals and targets, uh, a community platform, leaderboards, and all. So this this kind of uh, turned into a gamification to uh, save more uh, to. Uh, access more banking services and all. Uh, so these are some of the enablers that have led to this boom in the neo banking industry in the last uh, in, uh, in the last decade. Yeah. 
so we'll come to india now uh, so india uh, rbi doesn't allow full stack licensed digital banks so these are the banks which have, don't have any tie up with any other existing bank uh, and they can operate on their own so rbi has so far not given licenses for these kind of uh, neo banks in india yet uh, yeah so but what uh, we, the segment where we have the majority of the neo banks are the uh, virtual neo banks uh, which use which take uh, which take a help of an existing platform uh, ex existing bank platform so these neo banks they uh, they say they offer better user experience and uh, some value added services that are required uh, for the segments that they are targeting so jupiter f fi open are some examples of this category Uh, apart from that even the traditional banks have not been sleeping uh, they saw the, uh, they realized the advantages of having a digital offering and some of the traditional uh, branches started offering their own autonomous platforms so we have dbs bank which have uh, started with the dg bank uh, where you could do everything online and then followed by kotak which started with the 811 accounts uh, again uh, same everything online and then even psu bank sbi was not uh, lagging behind they also started their you know platform uh you you know stand for you only need one app uh, so again they also uh, entered this segment quite early uh yeah apart from this even the traditional banks started opening up so if you now look at icici banks app uh, they call it i mobile pay it is now open to everybody so you not you, you need not be a bank customer to use this i mobile pay and you could pretty much use it as a google pay kind of app uh, replacement as of google pay and all uh, yeah and uh, so the closest concept we have in india uh, to a digital only bank this full stack di licensed digital banks is something called payment banks uh, so there are currently four scheduled uh, commercial banks under the payment banks category uh, but there are couple of uh, big restrictions over there so in india uh, the first restrictions that uh, the, uh, that rbi has placed on payment bank is they cannot raise deposits of more than 1 lakh so if a customer has more than 1 lakh deposit uh, the payment bank has to tie up with a traditional bank and the excess deposit goes into that traditional bank account uh, and uh, apart from that these payment banks cannot do lending products so this is another major uh, drawback uh, basically the banks cannot uh, launch their own uh, loan uh, loan products and they cannot earn that uh, nim income so because of that these payment banks have largely been focused on or restricted to uh, offering payment services so paytm and airtel payments bank are largely into payment service payment services and paytm also offers this uh, distribution of other financial products uh, airtel is slowly building uh, uh, on that and the fino payments uh, has taken a slightly different approach they wanted to go into the financial inclusion aspect of it so they target those customers who are currently dealing in cash and they are uh, open bank accounts for them and ask them to uh, uh, do transactions over uh, over over their uh, banking platform so for example a daily wage wor uh, worker who is earning in mumbai uh, and is from rural part of maharashtra uh, if he wanted to earlier send money to his family uh, then he had to take uh, help of uh, friends or family uh, but now what fino payment offers is he can go and deposit the money at fino fino payments branch and the family in the rural part of maharashtra can go to a banking correspondent closest to them and then they can withdraw the money from there so basically they are more focused on the, the financial in inclusion of the bottom of the pyramid kind of segment uh so we look at some of the areas that the new uh, that these neo banks are targeting uh so if you take the example of jupiter uh, so it is, it has federal bank as its base bank it uh, operates on top of federal bank so its main focus is the millennial uh, customers so their entire app and all will be quite engaging and they have these products called pots and all basically you can save for different goals uh, and all uh, yeah uh, that is one example uh, so in india we largely have uh, neo banks which are focused on one particular segment uh then we have something like neo uh, which which is uh, targeting tourists and expat uh, expats by offering them uh, zero foreign ex uh, foreign currency exchange uh, debit cards uh yeah F fi is using uh, is wanting to target young professionals who are just into who have just gone into a job 
uh, they are trying to get the salary accounts of the, uh, of them into their uh, banking platform uh, something like open is uh, targeting msme customers by offering them uh, something like account management services uh, bill management services and all uh, similarly razor pay x uh, is part of razor pay group uh, which is one of the larger uh, payment gateways in india so again they are also targeting merchants by offering the bill management services accounting services and all also they are tar also targeting the uh, uh, the startups uh, they are providing services like offering uh, payroll management etc to the startup so that uh, they can do it uh, quite easily on one single app uh, apart from that then we have the examples of you know sbi uh, from sbi and 811 who who are just more interested in expanding the banking services uh, banking customers uh, base uh, so let's look at some of the challenges that neo banks are facing uh, the, so the first challenge that uh, that neo banks are still facing is the cost of acquisition so while the cost of operating the bank is quite low the cost of acquisition is still on the higher side uh, they, they are uh, rolling out a lot of incentives and all to acquire these customers and uh, while clear numbers are not there on how long it will take uh, a pure digital bank to turn profitable uh, it will be very much larger than a say a traditional bank which is launching a uh, digital bank uh, uh, subsidy uh, digital bank uh, arm so if you take a kotak banks uh, 811 customers uh, 811 accounts so their cost of acquisition will be much lower because there is already some brand recall uh, kotak bank and that help kinds of helps in uh, getting new customers whereas if it's a pure digital bank then they spend a lot on custom, uh, lot on uh, acquisition costs uh and the next major problem these uh, neo banks are facing is the it's tough to become a primary banker so one of the major ways that banks make money is when the borrow uh, when the depositors place their excess money on the uh, in the bank the banks can lend this excess money uh and generate the nim on that uh but a lot of these neo banks are uh, neo banks have started by focusing on say payments or some other uh, very niche uh, niche kind of uh, service and because of that the customers are also using that as a just a payments for only for payments they will be transferring money into that bank account and doing the payments and they are not maintaining the balances and all so without that maintaining the balances and all it will be tough to uh, get back this cost of acquisition and all so unless they become a, become the primary banker of a customer it will be quite difficult to uh, uh, for, uh, to have a sustainable model uh and then there are like regulatory restrictions uh, which hurt the ability to generate income so in india we are seeing that the payment banks uh, cannot uh, lend uh, lend the money that they raise from as in the form of deposit so because of that they won't be able to generate an uh, uh similarly in lot of other countries also uh, there there are restrictions on the amount of deposits that they can raise and the type of products that uh, uh, they can offer the type of loan products that they can offer uh so because of this the neo banks are largely uh, limited to simpler products or revenue streams and they could not uh, they do not have the complex uh, ecosystem of products that a traditional bank uh, has uh another thing is while the banks have been saying that uh, they follow all the latest technologies uh, use ai and all uh, to underwrite the customers uh, we are yet to see a uh, uh, long term uh, underwriting history of these banks so it will be interesting to see how they uh, manage going forward uh so again for more understanding of new banks uh, these are some resources uh, so all the four banks uh, four major private banks uh, in the last one two years if you see have come out with their digital banking strategy and these presentations and uh, webinars are available on their websites and youtube uh, so you can uh, get a better understanding on how they are approaching this uh, problem uh, by going through them uh next uh, this 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 book called bank 4.0 uh, again there was a earlier edition called bank 3.0 and 2.0 uh this person red king he talks about how the uh, uh, how the banking system is evolving he has been writing this books this series of books since 2009 and this is the latest edition uh, it covers a lot about the neo banks uh, and digital only banks uh and the same person runs this uh, podcast called breaking banks uh so he discusses more re uh, recent developments uh, and up to up to date uh, so he basically runs the podcast to stay up to date on the banking uh, in the neo banking space uh so yeah for 
so now that we have got some understanding of uh, what neo banks are we'll take a deeper dive into one of one of the neo banks called kakao bank uh, it's a south korea based uh, neo bank uh, yeah it, uh, it it has turned profitable couple of years ago uh, uh, and is uh, uh, doing decently well uh, yeah so basically kakao it has a backing of a large ecosystem so kakao uh, is a uh, internet conglomerate in uh, in uh, south korea uh, it has this messaging app uh, gaming apps uh, uh, this social networking kind of apps uh, payment apps taxi uh, that uh, ride hailing apps uh, and all and in 2017 uh, in order to tie up in with this platform uh, they launched this kakao bank uh, so in 2016 south korea started giving them licenses started giving digital bank licenses and in 2017 they launched the kakao bank uh, yeah so one advantage that kakao bank has it uh, is that it has got an already built in ecosystem ready to tap into uh, so uh, yeah uh, as of uh, fi21 uh, sorry calendar year 21 uh, the bank has about 18 million unique individual accounts of which 50% are below the age of 40 uh, initially they started targeting the millennial uh, new age kind of customers but the digital uh, the banking ease of banking services that they were offering were Uh, so like that even the older uh, generation of the population also started uh, using kakao bank so they are currently it is one of three digital only banks in south korea uh, it, the bank claims that about 64% of the working age population banks with them uh, basically they have a banking account in, uh, with kakao so largely uh, it offers the deposit and loan products uh, that we see in traditional banks uh, so in loan products Uh, south korea has had a restriction that oh, they could give only uh, they could uh, uh, give only one to three year kind of time frame loans so they could not give longer dated uh, loans so because of this all the loans are kind of short term loan products uh, apart from that uh, the bank earns uh, decent fee income uh, by offering services like debit card fees uh, for uh, foreign remittances it has a open banking architecture where others can use its apis and integrate it into their apps and make it easier for them to uh, bank uh, apart from that the bank also uh, follows a platform approach so where if you open the kakao bank's app uh, you can look at several other things so you can do say, securities uh, trading on the same app uh, by part, uh, by they don't have a securities brokerage license but they are partnered with other security brokerages uh, and you can use that link up and they do loan referrals and uh, co branded credit cards and also advertising so they show ads on their uh, ad banking platform and uh, earn some income out of that uh, so if you see the breakup of uh, their income about interest income will be about 74% of the total income uh, followed by fee income uh, which is about 16% and platform income is about 9% uh, so the bank expects this platform income uh, to uh, increase going ahead uh, yeah so these are uh, what they do in the fee and the platform income space to earn this revenue so debit card uh, transaction charges and all uh, fx uh, for uh, forex remittances and in the platform space securities accounts uh, they are tied up with five partners co branded credit cards loan referrals and all uh, yeah uh, so if you look at the balance sheet of the uh, uh, balance sheet of the bank so major uh, majority of the assets are uh, loans only uh, so th since they are not allowed to do a lot of these complicated products or credit substitute products uh, apart from the government gsec investments that they have to make uh, the remaining are all, almost in the loans only uh, yeah uh, so bank has been growing significantly almost 2.5x growth uh, in about 4 years uh, uh, yeah so if you look at the type of loans that they can offer uh, they are all short term loan products so credit loans are almost all these are, all these loans can be classified as personal kind of loans so we have this credit loans uh, overdraft loans uh, micro loans and housing deposit loans this is something uh, unique to south korean market so basically the real estate in south korea is very costly and uh, the renting uh, culture is also quite different from what we have here so basically the larger amount of uh, deposit that you can keep uh, you can give to the house owner the lower bill is, will be the rent you pay so this bank has stepped up and they have decided to uh, fund this housing deposit uh, housing deposit 
that the uh, renters have to uh, put up so yeah uh, so bank gives a loan to fund that and that is almost about 30% of the uh, overall loan book for them uh, yeah so on the loans uh, on the loan side uh, most of the products can be classified as uh, what you call as personal uh, loans uh, personal loan kind of products only uh, so coming to the deposit side here uh, here we see what we commonly see in uh, other uh, uh, in other traditional banks also so largely driven by uh, driven by current deposits uh, time deposits and the small uh, this installment deposit is nothing but rd product uh, that we have in here uh, recurring deposit kind of product uh, equivalent to a savings uh, account kind of thing so basically you save for a fixed amount of time every month like i said and you get an additional amount uh, yeah again if you look at the overall liabilities almost entirely is deposits because they have higher deposits than what they require they don't have any other borrowings also uh, yeah so if we look at the chain on how they end up making the roe uh, it is again uh, turns out to be pretty much similar to what we are seeing in traditional banks uh, so nims are about 1.98% uh, other income is 0.89 percent so bank uh, expects this uh, other income to start going up uh, now that they have got the scale uh, and uh, they are focusing more on the platform banking aspect of thing and uh, operating expenses are quite high for them at about 2.28 percent uh, you would expect a tradition uh, a bank to have lower operating expenses uh, but while they have been coming down they are still on the higher end one, one of the main reasons is uh, reasons for this is they still pay a lot of marketing expenses uh, and uh, fees and commissions to uh, other uh, other uh, platforms and all who uh, who uh, who acquire customers for them so yeah marketing expenses is about uh, marketing and that commissions that they pay to others is about 50% of the total operating expenses so again once that that starts normalizing this opex numbers will also start coming down uh, provision numbers are have been so far quite decent uh, so bank talks about uh, how they have complete access to the borrower they look at all uh, holistic uh, aspects of the borrower when giving out loans and it seems to have worked out so far but again it's a small history of four years we'll have to see what happens going forward yeah so another aspect uh, that is kind of impacting the nims is the limited amount of products that they are able to offer the one to three year products only that they have to focus on uh, recently like in this quarter it's in last quarter they got permission from the central bank of korea uh to uh, offer mortgage products and they just started launching that products uh, so once they are able to launch more different kind of products maybe we could expect the nim and all also to start uh, uh, moving up uh yeah our way are kind of low for now but still the bank is in an expansion stage uh, stage and uh, even the roes are also on the lower side uh, so if we compare a traditional bank uh, with the with uh, this cacao bank so in a traditional bank uh, we'll see a lot of uh, 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 what do you call uh, retail loans and followed by a decent amount of uh, corporate loans uh, be it uh, india usa or singapore uh, but if we see cacao bank they are only allowed to offer retail loan products and uh, you could classify the 100 percent of their loan book as personal loans to compare it with these other uh, uh, loan uh, loan products in other uh, other geographies but if you see at the deposit side uh, it's more or less same as as what we are seeing in usa singapore and uh, usa and singapore uh, yeah just another point i wanted to mention uh, so again roe for traditional banks in korea uh, is also in the high teen, uh, high single digit or low teens kind of number so still a lot of catching up for the for cacao bank to do uh, again uh, rota chain if you compare with the traditional bank and cocoa bank again you can make a very decent parallel comparison uh, with other banks only the operating expenses are kind of on the higher side and we know the reason for that yeah so on looking at how to value a new bank uh, traditionally we bank, we value banks on the price to book value kind of uh, basis uh, more so because the book value is more stable than the earnings uh, so these provisions and all that banks have to do uh, might be impacting the uh, earnings during down cycles and all 
uh, and because of that, it might not be stable and uh, it might artificially look in uh, the price to book value might artificially look inflated and all. So, sorry, price to earnings might look artificially inflated and all. So, price to book value is more stable. And also, if there are any NPS, they will eventually have to hit the uh, book value of the bank. So, even that is taken care of. Uh, but when we are looking at uh, neo these neo banks, something we have to, uh, some other points that we have to keep in mind are the cost of acquisition and the payback period. Uh, so again, uh, as we saw in the case of uh, Kakao Bank, the cost of acquisition still continues to be high, in spite of them having a ready-made customer base because of their already existing ecosystem. Uh, so because of that, uh, it, we have to keep in mind the payback period uh, and the cost of acquisition uh, for acquiring these customers. Uh, and again, the average revenue per user metrics can uh, have also have to be tracked. And uh, these three things have to be combined to see on how they are doing. So active customers into average revenue per user minus the cost of acquisition and the servicing. So maybe some multiple of that we can see of the earnings that they are uh, getting out of this uh, are some of the things we can look at. Uh, again, Rajiv has presented uh, on how to look at platform companies and all in February. Uh, so again, that is an interesting uh, presentation to look at on understanding on how to value these new uh, unicorns. Uh, so to finally answer this question, uh, whether neo banks are the future of banking or not. Uh, so I feel that the traditional banks still have a very large advantage. So they have, they have already established the deposit base and the customer base. Uh, and there's a lot of inertia in switching from one bank to another. Uh, so uh, so these neo banks have to work additionally, so uh, to to put in a lot more efforts in getting these people, uh, these customers to switch from uh, uh, traditional banks to them. However, one place where the neo banks can start addressing, uh, start targeting immediately is the underbanked and the unbanked area, uh, where they can uh, where the uh, where they can start offering their products immediately. Uh, also, the traditional banks are as long as they are adapting to the changes they can remain competitive because they already have this deposit and customer base. Uh, as long as they're keeping, keeping up with the changes that the neo banks are doing, uh, it won't be tough for them to remain competitive. Uh, and also a lot of these traditional banks have started offering their own digital banks within them. Uh, so you get the best of both worlds So in this kind of scenario. Uh, you get the low cost for setting it up. You already have a brand recognition. Uh, and apart from that, the operating costs for uh, running this will be low on the lower side. Uh, and uh, this is not just for uh, larger traditional banks. Even the smaller traditional banks, they can also ex uh, uh, get exposure to this neo banks concept by acting as a ba base bank for the digital banks. So some of the smaller or regionally focused uh, regionally focused banks can uh, tie up with these neo banks, and they can act as the base bank. Uh, with that, they could start growing their uh, uh, customer uh, customer base, uh, which would have been very difficult for them uh, because. Uh, they were largely focused in one area or uh, geography. Uh, so to answer this question, uh, well, traditional banks don't have to panic, uh, but they have to be on the lookout. So adoption to the competition remains to be key. And as long as they are uh, moving, moving in that direction, it should not be very difficult for traditional banks to uh, uh, stay ahead. Uh, yeah. So some references. Uh, there's this Red Sea report on neo banking in India. Asian banker came out with a report on uh, digital banking licenses uh, in Asia. And uh, New Holdings is another uh, neo bank, which is based out of Latin America, uh, Brazil, and all. So their S1 filings have uh, quite a detailed information. And Kakao Bank's annual reports and presentations that they file. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, any questions? Any questions? It means that was really good. <laughs> so nobody has any questions, at least in the live. Or oh, everybody. Sorry, this one question. Yes, yeah. not that good. <laughs> Very good presentation. So I just want to uh, make an observation yeah. um, about, uh, you know, we have been talking about this threat from uh, these neo banks or Paytm uh, kind of companies, etc. But uh, I would like to point out my experience. 
even today in US, if you transfer money electronically from one bank to another bank, your own account, it takes at least three business days. Yeah. And they may charge anywhere from five to twenty-five dollars for the service. Yeah. Okay, so in that kind of an environment, uh, these neo banks, etc., can thrive. But in India, you know, we have UPI now, right? And uh, NEFT, RTGS, etc., for at least for the reasonably sized customers. It's free service and it's instant, almost yeah. instant, right? So ATM, you don't have to pay. You can use any bank's ATM. In US, if you go to another bank's ATM, they'll charge 2 $3 for every transaction. So in India, the my observation is the Indian banks uh, have done a very good job of adopting, adapting t technology and, um, you know, providing these kind of services uh, within, as you said, uh, I mean, uh, I agree with your conclusions that the digital banks within the Indian banks, they have done a pretty good job of providing services. Uh, the other observation uh, is that you mentioned that, you know, the neo banks can target the underbanked and the, uh, you know, unbanked and underbanked areas. But uh, my question is, how would they get data about their customers? Like, Many credit card companies or lenders, they use civil scores, etc. So you need some sort of credit history. So if you tread into that area first, you know, when you have one-to-one -one relationship with customer, you can judge that customer. Even if they that person doesn't have a civil score, you can judge that customer whether you want to lend that to that person or not. But yes, you have something. There's no lending to unbanked. It's only deposits. Oh, okay. So, uh, if you go to Finobank's website, yeah. they have a very detailed explanation of how this works. The okay. banking correspondent could be a local Kirana store where you give cash or you take back cash. He'll do the entry. There's no lending. Okay. So, in that case, they will have only limited services. But I've I have seen some peer-to-peer -peer banking, you know, apps, etc., which came and they made heavy losses. Yeah. Right. So when you go to these underbanked or lesser bank area and you lend to them somehow using apps, there's a risk of losing a lot of money. Yeah, so on first point, yeah, I agree. In India, we have NPCI, which has done a very good job on setting up the payment network. In US, we, they don't have some, something similar to NPCI, which brings all the banks onto one platform. Because of that, they are all on their own platforms. Uh, and they don't, uh, for them to interact between each other and all, it takes time and it it has become expensive in advertentry. Uh, that has happened. Uh, in the second point, so what one of the things that Kakao Bank does it, it starts with something called micro loans. So for a customer which they don't have any uh, lot of bank history and all, they start with very small amount of loans. So similar model that MFIs follow over here. Once you start building up the repayment history and all, then they can start going ahead into new, more uh, larger product loan products. Uh, that is one solution. Thank you. I have a couple of observations. May, may I share? So, I think, uh, you know, uh, in general, I think the last slide which you mentioned, I think it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a good uh, summarization. But uh, I think we should also look at it from the point of view of the consumer, which means who is the current traditional bank catering to versus who is the new bank going to cater to or catering to. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the traditional banks built their business on people who first found jobs, then started saving manually. I'm, I'm going, I'm simplifying to make a point, but, and then decided to bank and started with savings, right? Uh, by the time the private banks came, the current generation, you know, it started with uh, savings bank accounts, salary accounts, and even then it was job linked. Uh, very few cases where you would have had people opening accounts before they started earning. But today's uh, scenario is a little different. Uh, you have an audience who's actually possibly converting minor accounts into major uh, because the parents have opened minor accounts for them. Even if not, these are kids who are studying away from their parents. I've, 
you know therefore accounts are being opened to be able to transfer money they are having some form of cards which i think the uh, even early millennials may not have had gen x definitely did not have uh, so gen z is a little different so i think the important thing to understand is how are the new so the, the needs are different you know what i'm saying so new banks are not these are not going to be people the gen z people are not going to be people who are going to be uh, starting out with uh, where should i what is the deposit rates you know that question is not something i don't think they will ask uh, they will want credit cards they will want personal loans they will want uh, and i'm not saying it's a ba- it's a it's a good thing some of it is also bad uh, in terms of the kind of habits that possibly are they are getting early so i think somewhere uh, the larger question is how i also think new banks today are are usually constrained because of the structure you know they are unable to lend they are unable to take deposit so what they what are they in business for you know honestly from if you look at this space so on one side they've cracked the code to some extent on the platform side of it on the experience side of it which is making the millennial uh, the gen z very happy i'll just narrate a personal experience uh, just now which i which is why my daughter went to college just about uh, a few months back she turned 18 just a few months back we have a i mean she had a minor account with a private bank and i'm not kidding that private bank took 6 weeks to convert that minor account into a major account okay 6 weeks after multiple follow ups and it was a and it was not that there was some error from our side or something like that it's just that you know they have a regulation that says the day she turns 18 the account will be frozen so we had to as consumer you know be careful ki bhai 18 ke pehle paise bahar nikalo you know taki paise na atke fir sab lo they said pehle pehle pan lo fir aadhar lao fir you know sabko upgrade karo fir hum karenge but by then the account is gone you know 6 weeks it took after multiple follow ups finally when we went in through a fit at the bank they still couldn't figure out what to do so they gave us insta debit card not even you know after all this so i'm just so it may be a stray experience may not be typical even these banks are doing a better job in terms of improving the experience the point i'm trying to make is that kid definitely would not want to bank with a experience like this because today's generation is different so the point i'm making is that they have cracked the code from a experience perspective from a consumer perspective they may need more support from a regulation perspective because obviously if they don't have services what will these kids do with those banks but somewhere so in that sense it's may have launched nice apps and all of that the traditional ones but they still haven't understood these consumers and and stuff like that so sorry long bit yeah. but uh, just wanted to share my experience yeah so these new banks uh, say that they almost all of them say that they offer better customer experience so the young uh the current young age people are used to this uh instant ordering instant refunds instant cancellations and all which if you look at a traditional bank it takes a lot of time so that is one area where the new banks are targeting especially banks like jupiter and all uh that is one area as as you said uh, where this new banks could get customer base uh, by offering better experience yeah again completely anecdotal information very similar to what was just said uh, coincidentally my daughter turned 18 a few months back and again went to college uh, the leading private sector bank took ages to uh, give her a debit card e- even though the account was converted to a major uh, but 811 account got opened within 2 hours and she had a functional upi on her phone uh within 2 hours so uh again both are private sector banks so one is uh, unnamed bank large one and the <laughs> other one was a- uh, 811 but more interestingly from the neo banks perspective uh a lot of people think why do they need to exist but uh in south in periphery of chennai uh almost everyone had these paytm upi uh qr codes and which is very common nothing new over there but the interesting part was the merchants did not need to look at their phones to know that the transaction has gone through whenever you paid money uh, the uh, voice uh, speaker uh, linked to upi would say that this much money 
has been received in tamil and uh, anyone who was even a, a uneducated person could operate that very very easily so i guess some of these people are getting banked and apart from deposits cost of deposits float funds uh, another business case for these guys would be getting data so uh, these merchants would be new to credit as such for the whole banking system but once you have their monthly turnover monthly profitability there are potential ways of monetizing that by tying up with a lender or something like that so that could be interesting use case yes. thanks so open and razor pay x uh, they target the sme customer base so basically they ask the smes to collect money into their bank accounts uh, from uh, from their uh, vendors and all so that will help them in establishing a, a use case for the uh, sme so that with that they'll be able to build a history and offer uh, going, offer lending products going forward so that is another use case these some of these new banks are targeting so sami a few years ago i heard that uh, the post office is converting into a bank and yeah. they are computerizing etc so of anything any progress so there they also have a payments bank called india post payments bank uh, i think they have launched the services but uh, after that i haven't heard much of it uh, i haven't looked into much they have a very good reach if yeah reach is very good something about yeah. it since we have no questions from the live audience we'll just go to the zoom audience does anybody have any questions on zoom it looks like we have no questions uh, thank you prithvi thank you everyone thank you one of the things got rough I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up. Dust ourselves off and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, "There are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there?" there is only one right way at ppfs we think like rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term PPFAS Mutual Fund There's only one right way Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully